Hey, we are live. Hey, folks, thanks for turning in to the Math Podcast. This is our uh, ill-conceived YouTube-only edition where we just do a pull list chat. It's short, it's fun. Everyone talks about one thing they're into right now, and then we let you get back to your busy and productive day. So uh, with me today, we've got uh, a – well, actually, Nick, you've been on a few times. Uh, Nick Garber from Apogee Comics. How you doing, Nick? Good. How are you doing? All right. Um, Nick, uh, why don't you do, tell us about what your work just real fast. Uh, I am the president, artist, and chief financial officer for Apogee Comics LLC. We're a small independent comic book publishing house um, dealing with titles like Transgenesis, Bengali, the soon-to-be-retitled Cardinal, uh, Phantom Hawk, and a few others I've got coming up. All right, cool. I know Walt's had you on a few times. Um, glad to have you again, Nick. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, to, uh, next to Nick in our virtual studio is Jacob Blackman. How are you doing, Jacob? Hello. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Um, and since we just had Nick do a quick introduction, why don't you give a, give a quick rundown of who you are? I'm an illustrator for tabletop role-playing games, mostly in the third-party industry. And I am particularly known for my superhero uh, line called the Superpowered Legends, creating characters for mutants and masterminds. All right, cool. Thanks for having you uh, coming to visit us again, Jacob. Uh, next to Jacob in the lineup, we got Chris McLaughlin. Chris, how you doing? I'm great, sir. I'm 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 on my first day of break, and I'm just back from uh, meeting John Waters. Uh, you meet John Waters a lot, don't you? Well, I, uh, twice. I've been I've been blessed to go to a live show and uh, hang out with him in an autograph session. So he likes he's going to come over and help you move next time. <laughs> that would be that. Okay, there's very very few things I hate worse than moving. But if John Waters were to help me move, I'd start packing. <laughs> All right, cool, man, cool. Um, Chris, why don't you give us a quick rundown for any listeners here in YouTube land who might not be familiar with uh, your background? Well, uh, in my secret identity, I, I teach uh, political science to uh, college freshmen. And uh, in my more exciting costume life, uh, I have been a freelance uh, RPG uh, writer and game designer for, oh my God, it will be 21 years next year. Oh my goodness. And uh, and I've been blessed to write for such fine companies as, as Pen I got started with Pinnacle, and now I'm uh, working for... Uh, uh, post world games, uh, greater than games, and uh, I'm looking forward to some uh, new and exciting t t opportunities in the future. Okay, cool. Um, I know she didn't mention one particular company there. Um, well, Weston Games is out of business, so uh, well, or effectively. <laughs> so I. You know, <laughs> okay, so you've been for 20 years. You're an OG designer at this point. So all right. Uh, I it really just I, I, I even I have to go back and count because that the figure just seems so unreal to me. Because I, I think I'm still on my default. Oh, wouldn't it be great to write an RPG book and get it published someday? It would. It would. Um, and next to Chris is Walt Rebilliard. How you doing, Walt? Hello, and for those who don't know me today, I am Patient Zero. <laughs> Walt runs Hazard Studios, and he is the godfather behind the superhero RPG Supers, uh, among various other things. Right on. Um, the rumor that he was the martial arts teacher for Taylor Swift and her squad, I think, has been debunked thoroughly, but TMZ still uh, brings that up every once in a while. So You'll never get it out of me. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> and she Look does live down. made me do. Right. And she does live down the street from me, so. Oh. <laughs> All right. Hey. Um. This is uh, the pull list chat. It's short. It's fun. We all talk about one thing we're into right now. Uh, Nick, since you're the new guy, you go first. All right. Uh, the thing I'm into right now, um, well, I've always been into it, but kind of getting back into it is Daredevil. Been a huge Daredevil fan since I was a little kid. It's one of the first comic books I ever read. Definitely got me into comics altogether. Um, the one I just picked up not too long ago, and it's been out for a while. I think it started its run in 2015 and ended about mid-2016 was Daredevil Chinatown. Um, it was written by Charles Soule and illustrated by Ron Garney. Amazing artwork in there. Um, fun story. Um, this is Matt Murdock coming back to New York after his stint in San Francisco. Um, so this is right after, kinda the, takes, uh, right after the Mark Wade run then. Right. Very cool. Uh, yeah, not too long right after that. So um, He's back in New York. He's at odds with Foggy. Him and, our, him and Foggy aren't friends anymore. Um, Matt's working for the district attorney's office. He has this big case, which eventually falls apart. But um, And then he's kind of took on like an apprentice, not a sidekick, but more of an apprentice. There's someone else out there in Chinatown doing the same type of stuff he's doing. And so um, he kind of takes him on because the, uh, the character that he takes on is called Blindspot. And he created this invisibility suit. Well, he's been using this invis invisibility suit to fight crime and, and kind of 
stalk Daredevil a little bit to figure out how to do this whole vigilante thing. And then he's surprised that Daredevil can actually see him. So that's yeah, okay. a fun story. And then you got the hand in there and some um, some really creepy ten fingered people and you know, like ten fingers on each hand. Okay. Uh, and and it deals with sense. Yeah, it deals with a cult and I I mean, I, w I really would like people to read this, um, so I don't, I'm trying not to give too much away. But um, the artwork is beautiful; it's amazing. It's a it's a great story. Um, okay. And it deals with a lot of a lot of other like like uh, social issues, like illegal immigration and things like that. Because one of the heroes is an undocumented uh, alien or immigrant. So that would be blind spot. Yeah, blind spot. Okay. Um, if you were going to sell somebody on this book, uh, what's what's the, what's the pitch you would give? The pitch I would give, um, if you are new to Daredevil, this is a good kind of starting point to get back into it because it does a really good job of explaining some of his this um, really a very stylized look to it. Um, it's not very, it's um, over rendered. It's if you're going in there looking for a Jim Lee style and I'm a huge Jim Lee fan, uh, you're not going to find it in there, but the artwork is very, very good. Um, and the colors are good too, and it really brings you into the story. It kind of it adds to the grittiness of the story. Okay, is this sort of like uh, Daredevil stepping into the stick role, kind of becoming a mentor? Yeah, it seems like he's kind of going that way, and he's having um, and he talks about stick in this book while he's while he's doing it because of course the apprentice doesn't want to do what Daredevil wants him to do, um, so he's kind of like putting himself in stick shoes when stick was dealing with him. Um, it's really, it's really fun to watch that internal dialogue. He's like, man, I don't know why this kid just won't listen to me, you know. How's that compared to like the Batman Damien thing? Um, I'm not, I haven't read up on that one too much, okay. but from what I have read, um, I would say it's very similar as as far as like tone and um, message, you know, where you got this kid who wants to be trained by this guy, but you know, is kind of resistant and hesitant to the to the method behind the madness, so. Okay, cool. So that's Daredevil Chinatown. Trade paperback is out now. Um, writer was Charles, last name is Sewell, I think. Yeah, S-O-U-L-E. Yeah, artist was Ron Garney. So check it out. Nick says it's good. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. And uh, Jacob, what you want to talk about? Well, uh, while I have a number of comics that I've been picking up recently, the news I was wanting to speak about uh, was released last week by Netflix. Uh, they released a press release about uh, a number of new cartoon series that are going to be released in 2018. Uh, the most interesting of them, for me at least, was the announcement of a new She-Ra Princess of Power series. And, you know, I, I'm, I've always been a pretty big fan of, of the science fantasy genre. And so She-Ra has always been on, on, on one of the top tiers of my list, despite how really cheesy it was back in the 80s. Uh, when, in comparison to, to its, uh, to its, to its partner show, uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, it was always just a little more compelling to me because He-Man was always very much about maintaining the status quo. The good guys are in control and they're keeping the bad guys down and making sure that everything stays the way it is. Whereas She-Ra, on the other hand, uh, the bad guys were, were very much in control. They were destroying the world, and it was the responsibility of the good guys to try to stop them, save the planet, save everyone, you know, rescue the slaves, all of that. And it was just much more interesting and compelling storyline to me. Despite the cartoonishness of the of the villains and the constant nasally voice of the big bad guy Hordak, I'm hoping they make changes to that, much like they've made some spectacular changes to series like Voltron. If they can do with She-Ra like they did with Voltron, I think this would be an excellent series. And in terms of writing, I have I have some pretty high hopes because the new She-Ra show is going to be helmed by uh, Noel Stevenson, 
for those of who know her, uh, she is the creator of series like Lumberjanes and Nimona. Uh, I, I'm not as familiar with Lumberjanes, but I have read Nimona. It's a really fun series about a shape-shifting girl who wants to be a supervillain. In a, in, a, in a fantasy world, so I, I do recommend a chance if you if you get a chance to read that series of uh, checking it out. So yeah, I'm very excited about Shira, and I hope everyone else is too. So when's that come out? Uh, they have not uh, given a specific release date other than to say 2018. Okay, so that could be December, that could be May, who knows? All right, cool. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Chris, what's your thing? Well, I there's this first pitch as a comics uh, uh, thing to me, and I I was sort of taken aback because like my one big comics thing is that you know this is the year that that uh, comics went from being like actively terrible and hurting me to just boring the absolute boring me like few things have, which you know, is uh, an improvement, I you, guess. You, Chris, you can say shit. That's cool. Man. Well, I you know I'm I'm, an, I'm a public educator and okay. my, my 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 students can download this. I, I, I try, <laughs> try to model some kind of be you know behavior. Um, All right, fair enough. You know, but but I will I will give DC credit for one thing. I'll I'll, I'll try I'll try not to uh, slam them too hard for their continuing TPing of Alan Moore's house and phoning it up in the middle of the night asking him if he's got Prince Albert in a can or things like that. <laughs> um, and to say that you know the more I I, I see about uh, 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 this uh, this this metal thing they're doing, the more I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by it, you know, because at a time when I I just I really want to read about somebody other than Batman and Superman, the idea of another Batman and Superman story, you know, except the story is about how mega awesome Batman is, just really didn't do a whole lot for me. But the more that it kind of takes on sort of this wild, imaginative Grant Morrison, only not on quite so much meth type take. You know, the more I might give this a chance, you know, I'm, I, I want to see how it plays out. But that, that that's looking like to be a much better series than I gave it credit for going in. OK, so there. So not a whole lot to say about comics. So I'm going to I'm going to break the mold. I'm going to talk about media. Uh, I, I usually tend to run a year a year behind because I'm, I'm a big lover of retro media. And it usually takes a while for new things to get to me. So it wasn't until calendar year 2017 that I got into series three of Black Mirror and uh, was just completely blown away. I mean, it, when, a, when a show that you already consider to be one of the finest things ever put on television goes to another level, that's certainly something worth talking about. And so, and because I can technically tie it into this podcast, uh, you know, it's worth mentioning season four is debuting on December 29th. And based on the trailers, I'm really, really excited because it looks like the program is really diversifying in the topics that it's willing to address. But I was just utterly, utterly blown away by how good C Series 3 was. You know, uh, I thought the first episode, Nosedive, I mean, that was supposed to be the funny episode. And that one wound up scaring me more than any of the rest of them. Because it's a episode about labeling and how easy that is to do in this uh, virtual age we live in and how we and, and just the, the direction that society could go, how much we can ruin each other's lives by these labels we stick on each other electronically. That one, it made me laugh, admittedly, but it just scared me more than the rest of them, quite honestly. And uh, play test, play test was pretty good. I, I, I admit I didn't see the twist coming and I won't spoil it here, but I thought I thought play test did. Did, did a good job. I'm all, it, it sort of made me admire about how Charlie Brooker can get you to like a character and identify with them and have them be real so that if they suffer a loss, you feel it too within the sort of abbreviated time frame of a modern TV show. So big props for that one. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, I've been trying to get my wife to watch play test for a while. That's, um, oh boy, that's, that's an effed up episode. That's, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and, 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 sh and, oh, and I, I can't really say a whole lot more about shut up and dance other than I just did not see that, 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 that one coming that, that, that was the twist that most just, holy crap, where's this coming from? But yeah, and, and it was that, and it was it was kind of it was kind of atypical for it because in your typical Black Mirror episode is about how technology makes us is making us more terrible than we already are, and then you know the ultimate message of Shut Up and Dance is that you know if you're already pretty terrible, technology isn't really going to do a whole lot about that, one way or the other. Yeah, I thought Shut Up and Dance was maybe the scariest of season three. Just uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I'm not gonna. This isn't really a spoiler, but um, you know how your laptop, or maybe your PC has a little uh, little camera on it. 
Uh, Nick, you have one right now. Um, <laughs> the premise of this was that they use cameras to spy on people, find incriminating stuff, which isn't hard to do if you have a camera on someone's computer where they do various things, and then blackmail them into carrying out various criminal activities. And it, it ends up with uh, the main character being forced into a fight to the death, you know, on, on webcam out in the woods somewhere. I should really start covering up this camera. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> and this episode is a great advertisement for that idea because, yeah. Um, yeah. Stuff's easy to hijack. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris, on Black Mirror. It's, thank you, thank you. I'm current to the latest thank season. You. I'm looking forward to the new one. Yeah, and and then and then uh, San Judipero, I had I, I had heard like amazing things about that, you know, months in advance, and I was blown away by how much I really really loved the episode for reasons different than everybody else's, and it was just sort of a reminder of how great this show can be that you know, at least in my book, you could walk away from that episode with two completely different inter interpretations that are equally valid. And it's still just a tremendous work, work of work of fiction there. Yeah. If, if you guys haven't seen it, um, the basic premise of it is they upload your consciousness into a virtual reality world. Well, I guess it's not virtual because it's just your consciousness. So you, mm. they take your consciousness, digitize it and put it inside a computer. And um, it is on my queue list. I have yet to get to it. But yeah. Hearing you guys talk about it, I'm like, well, as soon as I get off here, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, um, the one he talked about at first, Playtest, that's, um, I watched a lot of horror movies. I didn't used to, but a couple years ago, I kind of got into the habit. And that's um, that's the best scares I've had this year, is, is that really? episode. That was, uh, yeah, it's, I can't say too much about giving it all away. There's a big twist. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. And then that takes us to Men Against Fire. And after I, I say my piece, I would love to know what Walt thought of that episode. But to me, it has some it, it has some marvelous things to say about the nature of, of people in wartime. But I took it on. A, but I took an extra message away from it since it's essentially about this electronic device that automatically makes people look like monsters to you, and it literally makes you incapable of hearing what they're saying. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's politics on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so and 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 uh, I, again, we won't ru we won't ruin the ending of that one. But but man, that that you know, I I needed to go have a drink after that last shot. <laughs> you know that 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 was a real that was a real punch in the gut right there. And Walt, what did you think of Men Against Fire? I haven't seen it yet. So. Oh my God, go watch it now. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna get weird. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm still on season one of Black Mirror. Oh, so you have so many delights ahead of you, my friend. But I know what I'll be doing at the drafting table this weekend. Indeed, and then hate, and then hated of the nation just killed it for me on so many levels. You know, I, I about five minutes in, I, I said to my wife, "You know, I could watch a whole series just about Kelly McDonald and Faye Marseille's characters. You know, I, I want to see them go and solve other cases. Just the interplay between them two, between those two. I really, yeah, I just want to see a whole show about them." You know, I, I, I would totally. I would watch every episode of that. Should I? I actually missed that one. Yeah, and but but you know, but the fundamental, ep, uh, the, the the scary thing about it is, um, um, you know, this notion that you know that someday internet technology will be will allow us to kill people based on stuff we've heard about them on the internet. And that one really, really drove home to me because this is the year that. Um, that you know, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've kind of gotten numb to the why don't why doesn't somebody murder Trump posts, and while I have never, I mean, I have I have been never Trump since 1983, I'm, I'm not I'm not ready to take that jump and to say somebody ought to murder him. I'm just I that's just not me. That's not who I am, and I kind of wish that kind of wasn't what our country was anymore. But the, you know, this was the year that like people that are dear to me and I love them the day after the crazy guy shot up the, 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 the GOP's charity softball game were lamenting the fact that he didn't kill more of them. You know, I yeah, mean, it, that's yeah. not a good look. There's no way yeah. to put a spin on that. Yeah. I, and I, and I just, I, you know, uh, it, it just, it, it, you know, the, the terrifying possibility that, that the way the technology is going, that we will be, that we will be able to kill people based on what we heard about them with the internet. You know, that, that one, that one, that one's one I have not stopped thinking about since I, since I watched it. And uh, as, as, as much credit as San Junipero gets and deserves, to me, you know, it's it's men against fire and hated in the nation that, that that really have me thinking about where things are going in this country. 
And uh, I guess maybe the one optimistic thing we can say about the future is, again, season four, December 29th. <laughs> so, so, yes, that's enough to keep me going. All right. Uh, well, your turn. Uh, XO, Man of War, number eight, which is uh, entitled Emperor. It's the, uh, it's the uh, pretty much the conclusion of this particular story arc. Um, the uh, titular character... Um, uh, Eric, who is the owner of the Exo War Mano, uh, Exo Man of War armor, <coughs> has uh, over this arc has fled Earth. He wants nothing to do with the politics people or whatever from his home and has gone to an alien planet. And uh, through various uh, deeds and misdeeds, he has um, uh, endeared himself to uh, several of the tribes on this planet and realized that uh, they've been at civil war for quite some time. So in this episode, it's it's the uh, it's the the big showdown, the match. Um, it's for all the marbles. Uh, Eric, now a general, leads all these different peoples together to fight the last holdout of uh, the different tribes and the uh, the emperor of the planet. And um, uh, it, this has been like a long time coming because in in the series up to this point, he has been trying to be his own man without the armor. And because uh, he's on an alien planet and doesn't really know the all of the cultures and customs. Um, he keeps having to rely on more and more of the armor. And until we get to this episode where he's using it in total and in mass doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, but of course he faces down the emperor and, uh, um, you know, things happen. And, uh, the, the best thing I can say about this episode is, or this issue rather is, um, you, you get a sense of be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. And um, that's that's shown up in, in, in the last scene um, with a uh, pretty regular character from the series. And um, she just lets him know, you know, uh, there are two things that you can be sure of. Um, the grass is never greener on the other side and you can never go home again. So um, it's written by Matt Kent, uh, art by um, Clayton Crane and uh, Hanato Guedes. Uh, it's it. The art is fantastic. Um, the uh, if you haven't picked up a Valiant book lately, their covers are, are this thick card stock with a semi gloss. Um, the art has a nice painted and watercolor style. It's uh, it's really really a nice a, a nice book. So um, I'm looking forward to what they got coming up next. And uh, if you if you're not picking up these titles, you really should give them a chance. And that's my pick. Cool. All right. Well, hey, that's um, that's about half an hour right there. So uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, Nick, Jacob, Chris, Walt, thanks for coming out, guys. Good talking to you. Cheers. My Thank pleasure. You. Happy, happy, holidays. Holidays. happy holidays and happy 2018 to all our listeners. Yeah. Indeed. Happy holidays and uh, a festive Kwanzaa to all of you. <laughs> all right. It's, Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.